Publishing a book called Axes of Convenience about the Russian Chinese relationship. You've also written a book on Putin's farm. Yeah, a couple. Yeah. yeah. So I know my students have read some of that um, a number of years ago. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, as I said, his forthcoming book is Russian the New World Disorder. So we're really very grateful that you stayed. No, no, no. Thanks very much. <laughs> well, thank you, Angela. Um, it's I, I really thank you for um, inviting me to a fantastic conference on Monday. Really enjoyed it, and um, it's uh, I particularly appreciate the opportunity to stay here. And um, maybe we can sort of talk about a lot of Russian foreign and security policy issues in a sort of fairly um, discursive uh, discussion. Um, as Angela mentioned, I'm writing a book for um, Brookings and Chatham House called Russia and the New World Disorder. And this is really a kind of a, a flashy way of saying it's a book about Russian foreign policy. Um, because the last one that I wrote on, the, the, the books that you're referring to, came out in 2002 and 2003. So it's time to in a way, take stock of the Putin era and see what's changed and what hasn't changed. So hence the title today, you know, Russian foreign policy, the new and the old. Um, <clears throat> I want to discuss this subject under several broad themes. Um, and the first theme I thought would be useful would be to consider how Moscow views the world, how Moscow views the international system. Um, to what extent has Russian strategic culture evolved or not in response to a very rapidly changing global context? My uh, first conclusion is that Russian strategic uh, culture has evolved remarkably little over the last 20 years. Um, the Putin regime, like the Russian elite from, again, the last 20 years, sees the international environment, I think, in very much Hobbesian terms. It's a tough, it's a hostile environment where the strong prosper and the weak get not just beaten but crushed. Um, this is a world defined principally by the relations between the traditional great powers, uh, where geopolitical influence is absolutely vital, and where hard power is still dominant. And elite perceptions, not just the Kremlin, but I would say right across the Russian political elite, their perceptions of Russia's place in the world are centered in what I would call a strong abiding sense of historical entitlement. We, in the past, we've often spoken about, oh, you know, the divine right of uh, kings. Well, I think Russia operates on the basis of the divine right of great powers. Um, the Kremlin regards Russia as very much an independent pole in an emerging multipolar order, an indispensable actor in the international system, and not just as a mere regional power, but really as a global great power, the sort of this idea that Russia was, is, and will always be a great power. And a great power, by its very nature, is a global great power. But things are changing, but things are changing in a funny way to reinforce some of these preconceptions. Because today, Moscow sees Russia as the prime beneficiary of what it calls and what many call the global shift in power to the East, the rise of the East, the decline of the West. And it feels that Russia, although this poses clear challenges for Russian foreign and domestic policy, there is the feeling that Russia is actually stands to gain more than it loses from this situation. Um, it can present itself as a geopolitical balancer between East and West, specifically between the United States and China. It can also be the bridge in what it likes to call the dialogue between civilizations. It's a very sort of sexy sort of term these days in, in Russian uh, terminology. Um, and so overall, I would say the mood in Moscow for, although they recognize that there are particular challenges facing Russian foreign policy, the mood is generally one of strategic, cautious, 
strategic optimism. Now, people often say, particularly in the West, that Russia has a much better idea of what it doesn't want than of what it does actually want. So it's obvious. It opposes a unipolar world, you know, by which it means an America-led world. It uh, dislikes Western-led moral interventionism, like responsibility to protect Syria, Iran, so on and so forth. And it is clearly hostile to what it views as encroachment by outside powers in the post-Soviet space. Outside powers, by the way, doesn't just mean the West. It also means the Chinese, by the way. But I would argue that Moscow does know what it wants. And I think they want three things in particular. The regime wants external acceptance. Maybe not approval, but at least acceptance, acquiescence of the Putin regime's legitimacy and Russia's so-called specific path of development. I think the Kremlin is definitely looking to reinforce Russia's emergence as one of the three global powers in the new emerging multipolar order. So obviously United States, obviously China, and obvious to it, if not necessarily to all of us, Russia. And the importance of this is not just ego. It's also about being, it, reinforcing this idea of strategic independence, of flexibility. And finally, it's the third major objective is it's, yes, it's nice to be one of the three poles, but it's just as important for other, other actors to recognize that fact. So you want the rec international recognition of Russia as a gl global great power, but also as an indispensable player in regional and global affairs. OK, so that's, I see, the view from, the general view from Moscow of you know, where the international system, the international order is, is developing. My second section, though, is, well, what, it, what are we seeing? And it's one thing for Russia, uh, for, uh, for Moscow to the view of the world in, in certain ways, but does that conform to reality? So I want to, t the second section, I want to talk about the new world disorder. And I see something, I, my perception, perhaps not surprising to you, is somewhat different from the Kremlin's. I think that the international context has rarely been more challenging to Russian decision makers. Now, of course, it's challenging to all decision makers everywhere. It's a fluid. A lot of the sort of realities that we've taken for granted have, are much less certain these days. But I think there's a kind of complacency in Moscow that really that's mainly a Western problem. In fact, I think it's mainly a Russian problem. Because despite Moscow's claims, I don't think there is a genuine multipolar order today. Because certainly not if we understand multipolar as being more or less equipolar, more or less independent centers of global power that are able to counterbalance each other. I believe that no such order exists today. Instead, I think we, what we have is not a new world order of any kind. We have a new world disorder. And this new world disorder is characterized by lack of clarity, uh, blurring, growing geopolitical uncertainties, and quite considerable tensions. And I would argue that an unreformed, non-modernizing Russia that we have today is singularly ill-equipped to deal with the demands of a post-modern, a post-American century, to use Fareed Zakaria's term. Russia's greatness, however you define it, can no longer be taken for granted. It really, I think, needs to reinvent itself as an international actor. Because for all the talk about Russia's resurgence, its standing in the world, its influence in the world, is actually pretty modest. Its ability to really change things, even in its own region, is actually fairly limited. And I think Russia faces five particular challenges here. The first is it needs to demonstrate 
that it can make a real contribution, a tangible contribution to global governance, to global commons. The second challenge is to recalibrate, redefine, reestablish, find different ways of asserting its influence in the post-Soviet space. The third challenge is to develop a new quality of engagement uh, in and with Asia. We spoke a bit about this on Monday. The fourth challenge is to reconfigure relations with the West, the United States, Europe, even with so-called Western-led norms and, and ideals. And finally, although I'm not really going to talk about this much today, it does need to modernize itself, because not because to please the West or to sort of fulfill some higher noble ideal, but just to give itself the tools to be able to promote its interests in other areas. Because it seems to me that unless Russia modernizes, it cannot be any kind of great power, hard, soft, traditional, modern, economic, political, military, none of that will be possible if it doesn't modernize. So that's, that's a ch real challenge that um, the Kremlin faces. So if we look at some of these challenges now, let's, uh, let's start off with Russia and global governance. There's an interesting contradiction here because Russia is a member of an enormous number of regional and international organizations. In some ways, it, in many ways, it portrays itself as the perfect international citizen. You know, it, it bangs on about the U primacy of the UN in global decision making and so on. But I think it has very little respect for multilateralism, at least as I understand it, because I see multilateralism as a very inclusive thing. It's a, it, a real multilateralism is a situation where Norway or Slovenia or smaller countries actually have real influence in decision making. Russia doesn't believe in that vision of multilateralism. Its allegiance is actually to the much more exclusive concept of a multipolar order, a kind of concert of great powers. So basically what the big countries, the big powers shape global politics and the smaller nations, even regional powers, just play bit roles at best. Moscow also believes, as we've seen over Syria and in other cases, definitely believes in the primacy of national sovereignty, national prerogatives over supranational notions of global governance and universally applicable norms and so on. Now people say, well, hold on, it's just joined the WTO, the World Trade Organization. But I think that its accession to the WTO does not reflect a real allegiance to multilateralism so much as a desire for international respectability. Frankly, it's embarrassing to be the last uh, leading economy to be in, in the WTO. Of the top of the G20, it was the only non-member of, of the WTO. That, that, that's a bit of a shocker. And, it's, and so that's why Moscow eventually pushed it through with considerable support, I have to say, from Washington. More generally, I think Russia's contribution to the new global agenda is, whether it's a new financial architecture, combating climate change, human security is superficial at best. Now, part of this reflects a lack of capacity, but I also think it reflects, uh, reflects a lack of interest in certain issues. Putin, for example, has no interest in climate change. One of the problems that we're seeing in, in the current G20, even though Russia is, is, is chairing the G20, the problem there is that there is interest at the professional level but there's virtually no interest uh, in the Kremlin in those types of issues. They're just, you know, technical sort of, you know, you don't want to mess it up, but actually doing anything within the G20 is a really low Kremlin priority. Um, so it'll use the G20 to project a good international image, but 
it's really not going to do much more. What it does care about, though, and this brings me on to my next subject, is the post-Soviet space. Um, there's a big debate at the moment about whether Russian policy towards the post-Soviet space, or uh, however you like to call it, Eurasia, or, you know, it's rather, terminologies are re really difficult here. So I'm going to, with your permission, just call it the post-Soviet space. Is Russia being, is Putin being imperialist? Or, as some Russians would argue, like Fyodor Lukyanov or Dmitry Trenin, they say actually Russia is entering a post-imperial phase of its relations with uh, um, the, the ex-Soviet republics. Well, I'll give you my view. <clears throat> I don't believe that Moscow wants to recreate the Soviet empire. Not necessarily because it feels that that time has passed, but simply because it just lacks the capacity. And if you can't, if you've got no capacity to make it happen, it's, it, it's not, why waste time in sort of having stupid ambitions? However, I believe it remains committed to reasserting a dominant Russian influence and position across Eurasia. I do not, however, regard this either as imperialism in the classical sense or post-imperialism. I see it, I know this sounds a little, maybe a little bit fancy, but as a kind of post-modern vision of empire. So it's much more flexible regarding the means and forms of influence. For example, it emphasizes economic and cultural influence. But you have flexibility in means, but fundamentally, the goals have not changed all that much since Soviet times. It's important also to emphasize that Moscow's approach is much more disaggregated and bitty than it used to be. So it's not the case that, for example, all the ex-Soviet republics matter equally. Clearly, Ukraine is absolutely the top of the list. But so important is Kazakhstan. Whereas countries like Tajikistan, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, they're not throwaways, but the Kremlin attaches far less importance to what happens in those countries. It doesn't want Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan to go up in flames, but its active interest in those areas is much, much less, obviously, than Ukraine, but also Kazakhstan as well. Um, Hillary Clinton acquired certain infamy when she described the Eurasian Union as a re-Sovietizing venture. Um, I think she was wrong. Uh, but the Eurasian Union, although it has a certain economic rationale, is fundamentally a geopolitical project. Its purpose is to establish or re-establish Russia as the leading strategic actor in post-Soviet Eurasia. It is also important, not just in the Eurasian regional terms, but also to the idea of projecting Russia as one of the main poles in the global multipolar order. Because essentially the Kremlin has come to the calculation that, okay, the United States dominates the West. China dominates East Asia, or certainly will dominate East Asia. And so to be a bona fide center of global power, you too have to have your own regional patch. Um, many years ago, Leon Aron spoke about the idea of Russia being a regional superpower. In a sense, that's what the Eurasian Union is about. Moscow is cautiously optimistic about increasing Russia's strategic footprint in the post-Soviet space. Um, it's not that it underrates the problems, but it thinks it's, it's got good chances. And it's mainly got good chances because the West is much weakened and increasingly uninterested, as we've seen. In fact, the real threat to Russian ambitions to project a dominant presence in the region is not from the West, but from China 
and to a lesser extent Islamist radicalism. We spoke on Monday about Russia's uh, non-turn to the east, but I will, <laughs> I will mention this just briefly now. As I said on Monday, Russian policymakers are starting to appreciate that Asia matters in and of itself. But there is a substantial disconnect between this kind of global shift in power to the east, on the one hand, and actually Russian uh, priorities, interests, um, on the other, which are very firmly oriented towards the West. Virtually every single major foreign policy issue is about the West. It's either about the United States or uh, Europe or the West writ large. There are very few issues where Russia, uh, Asian issues where Russia really has a particular interest, like Korea. Not, not actually very interested in Korea. Only interested in Korea so much uh, insofar as uh, the United States is, and China are heavily involved. That's what matters, not Korea per se. Asia is, remains, a sideshow of Russian foreign policy. Um, indeed, Moscow does not have an Asia policy, in my opinion. It has a China plus policy in Asia. It's effectively bet the house on China and allowed its relations, particularly with Japan, but also with the United States, uh, to deteriorate substantially. I also think that even in Moscow's relationships with major Asian countries, such as China and India, it's not interested in them because they're Asian. It's interested in them mainly because they are incipient, as it sees it, global superpowers. So in other words, you need to have good relations with these emerging global players if you are to maximize your strategic footprint around the world. So Asia is still a sideshow. It just happens that these two emerging powers are Asian. But it's not about expanding uh, Mos uh, Russia's uh, Asian footprint. And indeed, that's why Putin attaches such importance to the BRICS. It's all part of that sort of mindset. The notion of Russia as a Euro-Pacific power, which you hear from time to time, I mean, that's, that's just a, the vaguest of aspirations. It's not a realistic prospect. Um, certainly the Mos uh, the, uh, uh, Russia's p uh, hosting of the uh, Vladivostok APEC summit has not changed that. That's really, with hindsight, and even at the time, did appear very much as a one-off Olympic moment. It did not signal a fresh approach, a vital, you know, dynamic approach towards Asia. Quick word on Russia-China relations. These are clearly expanding. Uh, both sides are coordinating closely on international issues. Uh, trade has grown significantly. They're asserting the primacy of uh, national sovereignty, opposing responsibility to protect, um, seeking to contain the influence of uh, Western liberal democratic I ideals. However, despite obvious similarities in their position, there are perhaps less obvious dissimilarities. They do diverge significantly in their view of the multipolar order, although they both talk about multipolar order and multipolarity. They di their conceptions of this multipolar order diverge significantly and crucially they have very different visions of each other's place within that system and of their own places. Because Moscow looks, uh, understands the multipolar order as being a kind of 21st century concert of great power. So a, a bit like Congress of Vienna, but 200 years later. And of course, Russia would be an independent pole in this multipolar order. The problem, however, is that Beijing does not see Russia in those terms. Beijing sees Russia, the Chinese elite see Russia as a, a fading power, 
uh, that's coasting on its national, uh, natural resources and has an overweening sense of strategic entitlement and that has more or less no capacity to exercise significant active as opposed to preventative influence. So in other words, they, they recognize that Russia is useful in blocking uh, Western-led moral interventionism. But Russia can't actually make things happen, can't actually create. Um, you occasionally hear ideas of, oh, you know, Russia and China, authoritarian alliance, or maybe, maybe some military alliance in the future. This specter is completely bogus. Moscow remains apprehensive about China's rise, which is the main reason why it won't go down this path. I have to say the Chinese are not interested either. But the other thing, we, we tend to, we get excited about this, but um, it doesn't really, I mean, we, we tend to be confused because we see Russia working with China to oppose the United States. And you sort of think, well, if, why are they doing this? Well, I would argue this, that Russian strategic anxiety or envy vis-a-vis -vis the United States is a much more immediate concern for Moscow, but it is actually a less worrying concern for Moscow as well. So ultimately, the rise of a hegemonic China would be seriously disconcerting because for all its faults, the United States has been a relatively benign hegemon, at least in, in, in the Russian view. So the rise of a, an uncertain, potentially much more aggressive Chinese hegemon would be much more threatening. However, that uh, is, seems to Moscow to be a long way down the track. Right now, its concerns are with the United States. That's why we, you know, we, we're getting all these mixed messages. I should say that the world view of the Russian elite not just business, but political elite, remains overwhelmingly Western-centric. The strategic and security focus remains strongly on the United States, and cultural, economic orientation is very much towards Europe. And as I said on Monday, most Russians implicitly believe, sometimes explicitly believe, that the West is superior to, vastly superior to the East in most respects. And this is reflected clearly in the latest foreign policy concept, but also in many other public and documents and private conversations. So speaking of the West, where, where does this stand now? Well, at the risk of stating the obvious, we are seeing a period of drift in Russia-West relations. Um, there are, for all the attempts by Jack Matlock and others to say that we, you know, we have really common interests, Actually, there are few common interests, at least as seen by Washington and Moscow. I would argue that the scope for cooperation is pretty limited. And as a consequence, the differences have become much more acute in recent times. The worrying thing for me is I don't think Moscow is particularly bothered about this deterioration. Their approach is very much one of selective engagement. So the Kremlin or the Russian political elite seek to maximize its own access to the West on the one hand, but on the other hand, seeks to block the importing or the influx of subversive Western ideas. US-Russia reset. Well, the reset is long over. I know there's a lot of talk these days about Reset 2.0, Son of Reset, Reset Light, you know, and, you know. But it's long over because the Reset, the original Reset, was a product of it, a particular product of its time and set of circumstances. And that time and those circumstances have gone. The bilateral agenda, therefore, is dominated by major disagreements missile defense, Magnitsky, Syria. Problem here is that the illusion of consensus, you know, that you pretend to agree with us and we pretend to believe you, well, that illusion has become thoroughly dissipated in recent times. And what we're seeing now is 
a kind of regression in certainly many of Putin's statements, but not just Putin, among many others as well, a regression to a visceral anti-Americanism and conversely, a reassertion of so-called Russian values, i.e. A, a very uh, conservative uh, interpretation of Russian values. Barack Obama's re-election, John Kerry's appointment as Secretary of State, I think has arrested the, or checked the rate of deterioration in Russia-US relations. But we shouldn't kid ourselves. The differences, we're talking mainly about atmospherics. The differences remain profound. And you could argue that those differences are essentially intractable. Part of the problem here is that Moscow sees an America that's struggling in the face of mounting in domestic and external challenges. It believes, consequently, that the United States needs Russia far more than Russia needs the United States. In fact, it believed right from the outset of the reset that the US sought the reset from a position of weakness. And it still believes that. And that is a real problem. It thinks it's got the whip hand in the relationship. The problem, however, is clearly Washington doesn't share this view. Washington, unfortunately, sees Russia as a secondary, very much a secondary foreign policy priority. And some would say almost peripheral foreign policy priority. Russia only matters in certain instrumental ways, like strategic disarmament. It's not about Russia, it's about Barack Obama's vision of a global zero world. And so what we're seeing in US-Russia relations is a kind of slippage into a state of uh, mutually assured stagnation and in which both sides kind of hope rather than plan that um, maybe things will be all right, maybe we'll be able to muddle through. This, is, this worries me because although Moscow seeks to avoid serious confrontation, I think it's going to take every opportunity over the next 12 months to remind Washington, look, we really are important. It'll continue to play a spoiling role in Syria. It'll flirt with the Chinese. It'll ratchet up the rhetoric on missile defense despite the cancellation of the fourth stage of the missile defense program. It'll keep pushing Eurasian integration in the face of you know, re-Sovietizing criticisms. And it'll undermine American interests in many places. And it wouldn't, you know, stagnation. Stagnation, you think, oh, you know, you can sort of live with it. But in a very fluid, volatile international context, it doesn't take much for stagnation to mutate into something more serious. Because there are no shortage of potential flashpoints. There's sharply deteriorating security environment in Central Eurasia post-2014. Possibly possible regional conflict over Iran. Aggravation of disagreements over missile defense. Domestic instability in Russia. What happens if oil prices continue to go south? And rising geopolitical tensions in the Asia-Pacific region, as we are seeing. Not just North Korea, but the South China Sea. Possibly Taiwan. China-Japan over the Senkaku Jiaoyu Islands. There's a lot of things that can go wrong, which can really foul up the Russia-US relationship. And on the other hand, it's very difficult to see where Russia and the United States are going to converge. Um, because even in the face of a common existential threat, potentially aggressive China, the rise of Islamist radicalism, I just don't see where the cooperation, the warm and fuzzy or, alter, or different type of cooperation is going to come from. Now, I'd like to say, uh, offer a, a more promising prognosis for Russia-Europe relations, but I can't. Because the, part of the problem here is that the Putin regime has no respect for Europe at all. They see Europe as a ragbag collection of weak states. And if anyone's a real casualty of sort of shifting international trends, the global shift in power to the East, it's Europe. The United States may have suffered, but the Euro Europeans have just been booted in, you know, off the field. 
And the last, what you've seen over the last few years is growing contradictions between Russia and Europe. You see it in institutional culture. So on the one hand, Moscow's emphasis on great power collusion versus European style consensual decision making. You see a, mark, a growing divergence in political values where Putin's authoritarian conservative contrasts to European liberal democracy and you see it in a whole range of policy differences which are really assuming a kind of vicious edge particularly sort of energy issues but not just visas Syria human rights domestic developments in Russia you know me you just there's almost endless list and part of the problem here is that the Putin regime Whereas once upon a time it said, yeah, oh, you know, we're, we're committed to democratic values and stuff. It doesn't even pretend. It can't be bothered to even pretend to subscribe to European values. So it doesn't want to be like Europe. It doesn't want normative convergence. It wants normative acquiescence. So if there is to be a common Europe, then it sure as hell isn't going to be dictated to by Brussels or the Aki Communautaire. Not a hope. And this idea of a partnership for modernization, well, it's just not happening. And this, if you like, militancy in Moscow is counterbalanced, I'm not sure that that's quite the right word, but by a growing indifference in Europe towards Russia. European interest in Russia is at a 20-year low. There is no conviction, no hope that Russia will be like Europe, will become more European. Certainly not while Putin is running the show. Um, the member states, they have so many problems, as you well know. They're thinking, oh, you know, we haven't got time to muck around with Russia. We haven't, we can't be bothered to pander to its sensitivities. You know, that it's, it, it's completely uninteresting to us. So what this tra all translates into is a kind of atmosphere of growing mutual alienation and deepening decay. In the longer term, Putin's vision of Russia as a re-emerging global power and his belief that ultimately it's about hard power means that the United States, not Europe, will be the centerpiece of Russia's Western direction, and actually Russian foreign policy uh, more, more broadly. Just a quick comment on the idea of the West. A few years, must be about 15 years ago, Ivan Newman wrote a, a book called uh, Russia and, and, and the Idea of the West. Russia no longer believes really in the idea of the West. It sees a real profound crisis in it. It believes that the conflation of Western and universal when applied to say, for example, values is no longer tenable. And it's confident that supranational concepts like R2P, responsibility protect, simply have become unenforceable in this today's era. So the final section just a, a few concluding remarks, which I put under the title of Out with the New and In with the Old. <laughs> Is it
one of your very interesting points, but we do have some to eat. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the former Soviet Union, it seems to me that still is a relatively bright spot for Russia, right? As you say, the West, I mean, the Europeans, you know, they have a limited interest, limited influence there. Eastern yeah. partnership isn't going to do that much. Um, the United States after 2014, um, you know, what are, what are we really going to be doing um, in Central Asia? I mean, we don't know, but the trend wouldn't be on the up. Ukraine, you know, there's a lot of Ukraine fatigue, and the U.S. is just kind of throwing its hands up and saying, you know, yes, we want to help Ukraine, but only if it wants to help itself. Yeah. And you said China is more of a competitor, but which, I mean, obviously, economically, it is yeah. in Central Asia. Sure. But, you know, it doesn't have the kind of soft power resources that Russia mm -hmm. has, right? I mean, the language, the culture, I mean, the... Central Asian elites, you know, sure. who identify themselves much more uh, sure. with Russia, and you know, countries like Kazakhstan that's very yeah. careful to balance. Yeah. So, um, so I guess the question is, uh, looking forward, probably Russia will be able to, you know, if not reestablish, I mean, strengthen its role there as the dominant power, mm -hmm. even though obviously it's always going to deal with China. Yeah. Because but Chinese, I mean, but China's goals, I would have thought are more limited there. But then I guess the question is then to what end? <laughs> yes, exactly. So um, I wonder if you could maybe say Absolutely. something about that. Angela, the, the post-Soviet space is a, a, is a bright spot for Russia. It's an interesting one. That. In some ways that's true, but in other mm -hmm. ways I would argue that Russian influence is slipping sharply. And in fact I would make the argument that if you took Ukraine, Belarus out of the equation, that Russian influence across the ex-Soviet republics is much lower than it was 10 years ago. So for example, take Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan runs very effectively a tri-vector foreign policy between Russia, China, and the West. Um, it so happens that Nazarbayev is smart enough to run this policy without, well, sort of paying due respect to Moscow and without needlessly irritating the Russians. So he's smart. But Kazakhstan foreign policy is much more independent today than it was at the outside of uh, outset of Putin's term. Ukraine is different. I would say that Ukraine, through its own suicidal statecraft tendencies, <laughs> is, is more dependent on, on Russia. But I would say, for example, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Moldova, Russian influence there is less than it was. Now, to some extent, that's unavoidable. It doesn't necessarily mean that Russia is running a bad policy. But if we just look at it in terms of actual influence, it's, I think, much less. And, part, and the, I think the main reason, you can criticize Russian policy so in different areas, but the main reason is that these countries, they've developed a real taste, and more importantly, experience of sovereignty. And so the trend, they will become more, not less, independent. They're notoriously cherry about getting sucked into integration mechanisms. So although, for example, Nazarbayev invented the idea of the Eurasian Union project, his conception of the Eurasian Union project, much more equal economic trade thing, is very, very different from Putin's unabashedly um, geopolitical project. So I would say, uh, okay, so I would say that uh, Russian influence is declining. Now, if it's declining, who's, Gaining. <laughs> yeah, where, 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 who's filling the bank here? Well, I'd say partly the Central Asians. Uh, partly the, the, well, certainly Central Asians, but partly the ex Soviet republics. They're, they're more independent. But it's partly the Chinese, which brings me to the second uh, the question. Chinese influence today is predominantly economic. Their political and strategic footprint is, is still. Pretty, big, pretty superficial. But things change extraordinarily rapidly. 
10 years ago, total Chinese, sorry, uh, 2000, 2001, total Chinese trade with the five Central Asian republics was a mere 1 billion. Today, it exceeds that of Russia to those same five Central Asian Now, the Chinese are saying, no, no, we're not interested in strategic footprint, we just want to develop trade, energy relations, and so on. That's true, actually. But there comes a time when your economic influence, you can't just neatly separate economic from strategic from military. There comes a time when your economic influence translates steadily into changing strategic realities. And I think we're about to get to that next stage now. So I take the point, I mean, because Chinese soft power is, uh, they're not making a very good job. I mean, Chinese had a, a great soft power offensive after the Asian financial crisis in 97, 98. But they've pissed a lot of it away recently because countries, obviously in East Asia, but also in Central Asia, are starting to worry about where does this end. So the Chinese have to be a bit smarter, and they could toss it away again. But I would say that they have the capability, they are filling some of the vacuum, but we're still at a very relatively early stage of that process. Right. Okay, questions, comments? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess looking at the topic of the fear of the spillover effect in Central Asia after the 2014 withdrawal, yeah. and you mentioned the decline in Russia's influence in Central Asia mm -hmm. and its decline in lack of capacity to actually promote some kind of change. Um, and then looking at the Central Asian countries, they're seeking military assistance from the West instead of Russia. So what do you see Russia's, when they have to deal with this situation, how is Russia going to promote its influence or militarily assist these Central Asian countries against the spillover effect that everyone's fearful of? You know, it's, Russia faces an increasingly competitive environment in Central Asia. <clears throat> the com competition is not the, partly from that the Central Asians are becoming more sovereign, in, they're, they're more sovereign-minded. Partly, even though the United States will be withdrawing its combat troops from Afghanistan, it will still leave a vast presence, but it could leave up to eight to 10,000 troops in and around the region. Um, the Chinese are there. But it's not just the Chinese. It could be the Pakistanis, the Indians, the Iranians, the Turks. And what Russia faces here, in a sense, it's, I was speaking about the new world disorder before. What you have is a new regional disorder as well. And I don't mean it's just descent into chaos. I just mean that everything is so much less clear. And that faces but that confronts Russia with real policy challenges. Because you can't just sort of send troops in. That's not going to do anything. So you have to really employ a whole array of means. So I think what Moscow will try and do, it'll work out first. Which Central Asian countries can we realistically influence? So, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan. Not so much Uzbekistan, although they still have some help. And the second question they have to ask themselves is, which Central Asians do we want to, do we want to take the trouble to influence? I.e., do we really want to get involved in Tajikistan? Because, you know, it'll be so, it, it, it will lose, we could lose political credit in the region. Uh, in the region. It could be enormously costly. Um, it, it just might not be worth it. We'll just have more important priorities elsewhere. So that's a decision they have to make. And then the third question they need to ask is, how are we going to do it? OK, we can continue to, uh, we'll maintain our political li uh, uh, ties among different elites. Fine. But the thing is, those elites are going to get younger. I mean, you know, that, that Soviet elite is going to give way to, well, it's already giving way to post-Soviet. It's going to be much more challenging to do that sort of what Celeste um, uh, uh, Wallander called trans-imperialism thing. Um, so the thing is, do you, how much do you really want to get involved? Is it really worth it? And what's going to work? It's very interesting. In the Kyrgyzstan in, in 2010, it wasn't just because uh, 
Moscow was being nice to Washington over the reset, it was that they didn't want to intervene in Kyrgyzstan because they didn't think that Russia had the capabilities to really impose any kind of settlement. So there was actually a fairly sober realization of the limitations of Russian power. So this is really difficult. So I think what's going to happen? Kazakhstan, there's no need to intervene because that's going quite well. But what happens post-Nazarbayev? Yeah. Uh, will a post-Nazarbayev elite be as well disposed towards Moscow? Will it be as stable? For Russia. So, in other words, there may be an imperative to intervene. So, you may feel, oh, we have to take risks. But I think what Putin wants, Putin's vision of imperialism, so to speak, is it's kind of an imperialism devised and implemented by accountants. In other words, there's much greater accountability. You can't just say, oh, we want to project power. But project power to what purpose? And I think that, therefore, what we're going to do is uh, 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 see is, is a highly disaggregated approach towards Central Asia from Moscow. But it's very difficult because there's so many moving parts. It's very, very difficult to establish exactly what those moving parts are doing. So, I'm going to ask a slightly fluid question here. No, no, no. Um, it's, it's assuming a number of things. Um, so you talked about just the lack of perhaps willingness or even inspiration for the Russians to cooperate on the Iran issue. Yeah. Um, sure. Some people have uh, prescribed then that you know Russia's waiting for the U.S. or Israel to take care of the Iran issue, <laughs> or they're assuming that Iran is going to become nuclear and so it's an inevitability yeah. and so it's something that is going yeah, to yeah. have to be dealt with. Yeah. And so in that sense, what I'm wondering is if Russia is looking to manage its near abroad in, in some way, according to its capability. Uh, and, and Iran, with a nuclear bomb, say, would become more active in its own near abroad, which yeah. is very close to Russia's, yeah. uh, and invoking its own rights and its own uh, mm -hmm. uh, historical, because yeah. uh, you mentioned that the historical influence, the perception of victimhood, and its own historical rights in Central Asia, yeah. as well as in the South Caucasus yeah. and elsewhere, where Russia seeks to uh, 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 revitalize its influence. So, so I wonder, I mean, Iran has been careful uh, yeah. to, to uh, toe that line up till now. Yeah. Um, so I wonder how, how Russia would envision that world looking mm. um, in its near abroad if in fact it's faced with uh, either an Iran going up in flames because of a strike or, yeah. or an Iran, uh, uh, you know, uh, suddenly uh, pushing out, projecting its own its own ambitions because it suddenly has yeah. the deterrent of a bomb. So. I think if Russia could freeze frame what today it would. I've used this concept before. It, ideally, it's like a situation of controlled tension. Um, so neither peace nor war. Um, there are a couple of reasons why. If you have, for the sake of argument, a peace-loving, democratic Iran that didn't go down the nuclear weapons path, that was nice to its neighbors, that didn't overly interfere in Iraq, and didn't intervene in Central Asia, uh, that would be fine in some respects. But that Iran would almost, almost certainly be pro-Western, pro-US. Geopolitically, would be considered to be a big defeat by Moscow for Russian interests. On the other hand, an Iran that goes up in flames, there's some kind of conflict, either Israeli or even a wider conflict, then that will inevitably bring the Americans in. And not necessarily militarily, but strategically. The, the, the American strategic presence will be much stronger. And Russia will also lose out from that, geopolitically. Um, so both those outcomes, peace and war, peace and prosperity, war and destruction, are bad. We'll see them bad. But a situational controlled tension is quite handy, because it allows Russia to project itself as indispensable, as someone who can 
not necessarily completely shape as Iranian policy, certainly not, but at least have some input into Iranian decision making. Maybe a slight restraining effect, possibly. Uh, so it can make itself valuable to the West. And it can make itself valuable to the Iranians because it's seen as obstructing violent action against Tehran. And the beauty, there's a bonus here. The beauty about controlled tension is it keeps the United States on the hop and distracted, and unwilling, therefore, to vigorously project power in other areas of particular interest, and arguably of greater interest to Moscow. So if you have a situation where the United States is focused on Iran, focused on strategic disarmament, it's not going to muck around in the post-Soviet space. There's not going to be any will to do that. So this is quite good. So for all sorts of reasons, the status quo, you know, a mythical status quo, but the status quo is a good out for Russia. The trouble is with status quo is that by their nature they, they become, um, that they're unstable. They, they, they do move towards something. Um, so the idea that somehow you can freeze <coughs> indefinitely is, 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 is flawed. But I'm just saying, if they could have it, that's what they would have. Um, you mentioned that Putin ultimately believes in hard power, yeah. which is soft power. And um, I was wondering how you reconcile that stance with his interest in starting the Eurasian Union um, and potentially projecting economic and soft, softer powers in the region, whether that sure. was just kind of a superficial thing that he did just to impress other people globally, or whether he really thought that way. Okay. It comes down to how you understand hard and soft power, doesn't it, really? Um, I, I, I'll tell you how I understand it, and, then, and I mean, you may not agree, but my idea of hard power is hard power doesn't just mean traditional political and military power. It literally means power through pressure, as well as power through force. Whereas soft power, I understand, <laughs> is power through persuasion. The ability to convince you that soft power. So in other words, you can use economic and other means in a hard power way. Or you can use military power in a soft way. For example, joint military exercises, um, uh, uh, confidence building measures, that kind of thing. So it's important not to be, uh, not but not to be too dogmatic about this. I think, however, that in Moscow, they view soft power essentially in two terms. The first term is they see soft power as non-military power. And as I said, I, 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 I don't find that convincing. The second thing is they see soft power as PR. Um, so the idea of using Western public relations firms like Ketchum is a form of soft power. Using um, Russia Today, uh, or Rosso Trudnichestra, or Ruski Mir, those are not a kind of soft power, as understood in the Kremlin. But I don't, again, it, soft power is much more than PR. But it's understood, I think, in Moscow as PR. So, coming, how does this translate into the Eurasian Union? The Eurasian Union is interesting because, in some ways, it, it, you're seeing a combination of soft and hard power, smart power, uh, Igor Ivanov speaks about. It's soft power in the sense of, look, it's really going to be good for you. We'll give you incentives to join the customs union. It'll be good for your economy. It'll be great for our trade. You stand to win. That's the soft power argument. The hard power argument, though, is what we're seeing uh, in the pressure that Moscow is applying on Kiev to join the customs union. So you, you cannot uh, have anything to do with the EU 
sort of association agreement, the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. It's either us or them. And if it's them, then we won't, we'll, we'll screw you on the gas prices. That's hard power, by any, I would argue, by any definition. So what we're seeing in the Eurasian Union is that combination of soft power. We start off with soft power, but always have that hard power option. So I think that's a classic case of really, I think, you know, Moscow's more subtle. It employs a, a more diverse range of instruments policies these days. But the, fundamentally, as I said, the goals remain the same. But hard power is often dressed up as soft power. Actually, incidentally, um, the, on the foreign policy concept, Putin talks about soft power in both a positive and a negative way. He talks about it positively and said, you know, we need to do soft power. You know, we need to you know, uh, uh, communicate Russian culture and values and interpretations. And, so, and it's perfectly reasonable. But on the other hand, he talks about the insidious influence of soft power as practiced by the West, by which he means the importation of subversive values into Russia. So this, it's quite interesting. Soft power is still a highly suspect concept, or viewed in a highly suspicious way by the Kremlin. More questions? Comments? Yeah, I well, we yeah, really look forward to your book coming out. This was a great talk. Come back with the books. <laughs>